Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the case may be for you. We're glad that you've decided to join us for our Easter celebration here digitally at Alliance Bible Church. You know, if you're tuning in for the first time, I want to give you a special welcome. Uh, glad that you are a part of this celebration, and um, I'm praying that this is a, a truly spiritually meaningful uh, moment for you. If you find that you have questions about our church or you are curious about it, feel free to look us up, myabc.church. Um, we're on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're also on YouTube. Uh, you can check out previous messages and uh, discover a little bit more about what drives us. Our vision here is captivating generations with the satisfying gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe Jesus has the best news available to anybody out there. And in these times, such as the ones we're in today, um, that message of hope is needed. And uh, I hope and I pray that you discover that to be true in your life today. So let's celebrate together. One, two, three, four. He is risen, and he is risen indeed. I hope that you found great joy in seeing faces of our church um, blending together for a time of celebration. You know, every great story uh, needs a context. 
If you see an isolated scene in a story and you're not sure what happened before or what happens after, it can lose its effect. The same is true of Easter. And so what we wanna do in order to heighten the anticipation of this celebration is remind you of what happens before and why it is that what happens before electrifies this day. We're gonna do that in just a minute, but I wanna pray that the Lord does some great things in us as we participate in this service together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. It's an amazing day with eternal implications. I pray that if we've never come face to face with it before, that we would today. And that our hearts would be tuned to sing your praises like never before. Open our minds now to see the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray, amen. It all happened so fast. One minute it was Passover, and the next, I was hearing rumors of a trial, beatings, and false accusations. They put a crown of thorns on his head, and they led him away like a lamb for sacrifice. I went to meet him at night. Um, he, he spoke to me about a truth uh, that wasn't afraid of the darkness. I was afraid. I was afraid of what other people would think. I didn't want anybody to see me with him just in case they thought that, I don't know, that I was a follower. I had way too many questions. He talked about the wind and being born of the Spirit. I'm a learned man. I mean, I am a well-versed intellectual. And his teachings were so far beyond me. No one hangs on a cross because they want to. I did what I did. I'm not proud of it. I'm not going to make any excuse for it either. It, it just happened. And I got caught. On the day of my trial, I couldn't even eat. Hope will do that to you. The hope that you'll be pardoned even though I knew I should hang. But there was no mercy for me that day. I went numb when I heard the word crucify. I watched others getting that punishment as I was growing up. The fear that 
gripped me was indescribable. The fear tries to kill you long before the nails do. The road was unbearable. Every step brings you closer to unrelenting torture, literally. And there's no going back. The only comfort is knowing that it won't last. I'll die soon. I'll die soon. God was with him. I told him that. God is with you. Otherwise, you would not be able to do the signs and wonders. And were they wonders? Eyes opened, the deaf hearing, lame men walking, and the dead. Lazarus was dead, and now he's not. I had never seen anything like these miracles. You see, I was the one the angel Gabriel came to. I remember it like it was yesterday. The majesty and wonder of that moment. You shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and of his kingdom there will be no end. I knew he was the Son of God, and I knew this didn't have to happen. He could have stopped them. Why was this happening? The man beside me? He was innocent. I knew it. I could see it in his eyes. He, he didn't deserve to be here. And the crowd, the crowd that day was unlike anything I've ever seen. They were more of a mob. And the mob hated him. They, they cussed and cursed and jeered and spit and he didn't do anything to defend himself. All he said was, forgive them. That baby I held, he was the son of God. If Jesus could forgive the men who nailed him to a cross, well, then he could forgive me. J Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. When it was done, I didn't know what to think. My colleagues, my fellow teachers, my friends, they thought it was necessary. They thought they had accomplished the greater good. You know, that first night I met him, he spoke of truth, not being afraid of the darkness. I believe he spoke the truth, and I wanted to honor him for that. So, Joseph and I, we, we poured the spices on his body and we buried him. I couldn't go, not when it was light. I had too many tears. I was afraid I would never stop crying. I brought the spices. He deserved a proper burial. I had so many questions. What now? Why? Was it all a lie? But there were no answers. So I just kept walking. I denied him. God forgive me, I denied him. And I was so afraid that if I let them find me, I'd deny him again. I had imagined every possible scenario in my head. Perhaps the guards would help us roll away the stone. Maybe God would give me the strength to roll away the stone myself. Maybe 
maybe I'd be arrested. After all, who would want to anoint his body but one of his professed followers? Maybe they'd just kill me instead. Who would miss a prostitute? I drove myself crazy, thinking through every possible scenario, thinking I had thought of them all. But when I arrived at the gravesite, I realized I was wrong. I hadn't pictured this. Jesus never responded. He just stood there. Jesus just stood there. I watched him raise Lazarus. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw Jesus do it. And yet, he let himself be crucified. None of it made any sense. It was as if the nightmare just wouldn't end. I started to cry louder and louder. Who has taken him? They have taken the body of my Lord and I don't know where they have put him. Please tell me, who has taken him? Alive? He was here, and everybody saw him, except me? I told him, I said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe them. I was with John when the women came back from the tomb. Alive? What? We ran to the grave, but he wasn't there. I wanted to believe. John did. But I, I just didn't know what to think. In one last desperate breath, I said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him. It was then that the gardener turned to me and said, Thomas. Peter. Mary. He said my name, and I knew that it was him. In that instant, everything changed. I touched his hands and feet. And I believed. I believed. I believed. I know how to doubt. My Lord understands doubt. But I'm telling you this so you don't have to. I'm telling you the truth, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you can have life in His name. He's alive! He's alive. He's alive.
by the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of Such boundless grace, the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me. Oh,
Father, we celebrate our risen Savior, our living hope, Jesus Christ. Up from the grave he rose. He is risen indeed. Our hope has come alive. We celebrate. Jesus, Lord Jesus, we celebrate you today. We celebrate your victory over the grave. We celebrate the new life that is found in you. Because of your resurrection, Jesus, we can look to our own. We have hope for a future. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your power that we proclaim today. Power over sin and death and the grave. Rejoice in you, our risen Savior, today. Have your way this morning as we worship you. Soften our hearts to hear your word. Open our eyes to you and our ears to you. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, I'm going to read verses 20 to 23, and I'm going to skip down and read verses 35 through 44a. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive but each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives it it, its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh. Animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies. And there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind. And the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor. The moon, another. And the stars, another. And star differs from star in splendor. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. This is God's word. Someone has written... There is a preacher of the old school who speaks as boldly as ever. He is not popular, although the world is his parish, and he travels every part of the globe and speaks in every language. He visits the poor, calls upon the rich, preaches to people of every religion and no religion. And the subject of his sermon is always the same. He is an eloquent preacher, often stirring feelings which no other preacher could and bringing tears to eyes that never, ever weep. His arguments none are able to refute, nor is there any heart unmoved by the force of his appeals. He shatters life with his message. Most people hate him. Everyone fears him. And his name? Death. Every tombstone is his pulpit. Every newspaper prints his text. And someday, every one of us will be his sermon. Over the recent weeks, we have been bombarded with stories and statistics of infection rates and hospitalizations and fatality rates. We're swimming in a sea of death. But anyone who has ever bothered to read the scriptures ought not be surprised by any of it. In the very first chapters of the Bible, God told us running from him, disregarding him, demoting him, ignoring him would result in a universe of death. In desperation, where do we turn? 
The scripture we're pondering today is a great place to start. 1 Corinthians 15 is God's answer to Genesis 3. 1 Corinthians 15 is God's answer to Genesis 3. Now, throughout the ages, there has been a question that nearly every human being has at least wondered about. What about the afterlife? Is there one? If so, what will it be like? As we already read in these verses, Christianity has taught for centuries that for the believer in Christ, there will be a bodily resurrection. And as we'll see, this both blows the mind as it is wonderful news because if there is an afterlife, a bodily existence is the best one to have. But this teaching of a bodily resurrection hasn't always been met with approval. In fact, there were people in the Corinthian church to whom Paul writes this letter who ridiculed the notion of a bodily resurrection. They thought such an idea to be ludicrous. I mean, you can imagine the conversations they were having at the Easter dinner table. Uh, The resurrection of the body, how exactly will that work? What, What kind of body will these dead have? Will it be your baby body? Will we all come back as babies wearing our onesies? Will it be our adolescent body plagued by acne? Well, if that's the body I'm going to have, then I'll pass on heaven. Will it be our elderly body, sagging, bagging, wrinkling, balding? What about all the bodies that have been subject to decay? What's it going to be like? With what kind of body will they be raised? Now, where does, this, where does Paul get this notion of a bodily resurrection? Well, he gets it from this very same chapter in 1 Corinthians, starting in verse 3. Let me read it for you. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. So Paul says, check this out. The reason you can believe that there's a bodily resurrection is that Jesus rose from the dead and he is the prototype. 500 people saw him. Some have fallen asleep, others haven't. Get in your car, go to Jerusalem and go talk to them. In other words, Easter isn't just a celebration of a past resurrection. It's a celebration of a future coming resurrection, your resurrection. So let's look at it. What will it be like, who makes it happen, and how to receive it? This is what we're going to ponder today as we think about the believer's resurrection. What it will be like, who makes it happen, how to receive it. First, what it will be like. What will be the nature of the bodily resurrection? Paul uses two examples from nature to illustrate the bodily resurrection of the believer. The first one is in verses 37 and 38. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and each kind of seed he gives its own body. There's the imagery. Now let me show you a picture. This is a side-by-side picture of wheat seed and what it turns into, a wheat stalk. It's wheat seed, Wheat stalk. Now, one could make the case the stalk possesses more subtleties, complexity than the seed. There's continuity, that is, a wheat seed produces wheat stalk, not an oak tree, but there's discontinuity. When you look at the plant that emerges from the seed, you, you kind of wonder how can that come from the seed? How can that come from that? Now, Paul doesn't limit the visual example to wheat. He says of wheat or of something else. So here's a side by side picture of tulip bulbs and tulips. It really is hard to imagine how, a, how beautiful flowers like this can come from bulbs that look like that. How can this come from that? <laughs> Your physical body, the one God gave you for this life, is a seed, Paul says. The body God will give you at the resurrection will be even more beautiful, more complex, more sophisticated, more proficient. Think about that for a minute. The body you have now is but a seed compared to the body you will have. God, think about this, God outfitted us for life in this world and he determined that we needed to be outfitted with five senses for life in this world. The seed he gave us has five senses. See, smell, taste, touch, hear. That's just a seed. Could it be 
the body God outfits us with for the next world will have 10 senses or 100 senses? The point is this, your resurrection body won't just be a spruced up version of the body you have now. In other words, you can't go in there looking like that. It will possess a beauty, complexity, sophistication, proficiency that your body now does not have, but it will be you. Now there's another picture that Paul uses to help us understand what the bodily resurrection will be like. Look at verses 39 to 41. Not all flesh is the same, People have one kind of flesh. Animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun is one kind of splendor, the moon another, and stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. So what, God, what Paul's saying is that God created this world with various environments, and then he created life forms to inhabit those environments. He gave those life forms bodies perfectly suited to those environments. Birds have bodies perfectly suited for life in the air. Fish have bodies perfectly suited for life in the water. Planets have bodies perfectly suited to existence in space. So if God can create bodies perfectly suited for the environments they inhabit in this world, the same will be true in the world to come. This is the Apostle Paul's argument. So picture it this way. When astronauts head to outer space, they can't just put on a pair of jeans and tennis shoes and then head on out. They suit up. They prepare themselves for an otherworldly experience. They prepare themselves for another environment. So if you think this body, this body with all its fragility and weakness and powerlessness and despair and decay is gonna somehow just get zipped up into heaven, you're not understanding God's plan process. So do me a favor at some point, just go walk over to a mirror, look at yourself and say, I can't go in there looking like this. And some people are thinking, thank you, Jesus, I don't want to go in there looking like this. So if God can create this world and bodies suited to inhabit it, don't you think God can manage to create another world with bodies suited to it? Now, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this, from, from Paul's point here in these verses, this, Christian, you are destined for an eternal physical existence. You will inhabit an eternal, eternal physical new creation. Just imagine that. And what if, what if the seed to plant relationship that is true of our bodies now to our resurrection bodies is also true of creation? What if... The Colorado Rockies are only a seed compared to what's to come. And what will emerge at the dawn of the resurrection will be of something of greater splendor than they are today. What if the aqua colors of the Caribbean Sea are only a seed compared to what's to come? And what will emerge at the dawn of the resurrection will be something of greater beauty and tranquility. What if an ocean of wildflowers that decorate the meadows are but a seed compared to what's to come? A new body with a hundred senses, mountains, oceans, beaches, flowers, like we've never, ever seen or experienced before. I can't wait. I can't wait. I don't know about you, but I can't wait. That's what it'll be like. Second, who makes it happen? Look down in your Bibles if you would. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 37 and 38. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body, as he has determined, and to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. Now, when you're out working in the garden this spring, you're planting seeds, we prefer to think of such things as a natural process. It's the life cycle, right? We're taught that in school growing up. Seed, germination, growth, reproduction, pollination, seed spreading stages, the life cycle. The Apostle Paul does not talk about it that way. How does he put it? He says, God gives it a body as he has determined. God gives it a body. And then in verse 42, Paul says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. Now, without this little detail, we could be tempted to believe that the bodily resurrection of the dead is a natural process 
And that receiving a resurrection body is just part of that inanimate process. But the biblical writers are more God-centric than we tend to be. We look at tulips and conclude they got there through natural processes that exist external to God. Paul looks at tulips and says, no, that's not the way it works. God gives them bodies. So what should that produce in us? You cannot count on a natural process to give you a resurrection body with 100 senses. The only way, the only way you're getting that kind of body is if God gives it to you. And that ought to produce in us an intense God-centricity and God-dependency. If it's not a natural process whereby I receive a resurrection body, but it's God who gives it to me, then from first to last, I have a God-dependency that I must acknowledge and live under. This, this wonderful, glorious, resplendent existence that we look forward to cannot be obtained any other way than through the gifting of it to us by the creator God. God gives it a body. It's a gift. I've been thinking a lot about gifts because of the way Paul seems to emphasize it in this text. The resurrection body is a gift. It's a gift. We adults need to refamiliarize ourselves with the concept of a gift. I was thinking back to, to Christmases and birthdays during my childhood years, boyhood years. As a young kid, I often couldn't sleep the night before Christmas or my birthday because I was ex so excited about the next day. And a lot of what was fueling a lot of that excitement are the gifts. And I see that in my own kids now. You know, what did they get me? You know, what's underneath the wrapping paper? I couldn't sleep. I was so excited. As an adult, what is that like now? I know there are times when my kids can't get me out of bed early enough on Christmas morning. I just want to sleep in. And, and my birthday, uh, you know, adults, what happened to us? What happened to us? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with our relationship to the gifts. We've lost a sense of awe about the gifts. And why is that? Why is that? Let's be honest with ourselves here. As adults, the gifts we get are most often gifts we can afford and purchase ourselves. They're easily within reach. I mean, be honest. How many of you have ever thought, well, if I don't get this for Christmas, I'll, I'll just go out and get it for myself later? Huh? I'll never forget the gift I got for Christmas when I was 10 years old. It was a handheld video football game. Cheesy by today's standards of gaming. But I had been eyeing this game in a Santa Fe Walmart for weeks leading up to Christmas. But the price tag on it was something like $30. For a 10-year-old in 1989, that was way beyond my means. So I was completely dependent on my parents to get that for me. The best gifts are those you cannot obtain yourself. Those gifts are the ones that melt your heart and cause you to respond with joy and gratitude. The best gifts are lavish, generous gifts you cannot obtain for yourself. Listen, the price tag of a resurrection body is way beyond your means. Way beyond your means. Which means in order to obtain it, you are completely dependent on God to give it to you. If a glorious, resplendent, majestic resurrection body living in a glorious, resplendent, majestic new creation is something you long for, hope for, want, that ought to lead you to a degree of God-centricity and God-dependence, the likes of which you may have never experienced before. So who's going to get a resurrection body? That's our last question. How do you receive it? How do you receive it? We know what it's going to be like. We know who makes it happen. But how do we receive it? The answer is up in verses 20 to 22. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now the Apostle Paul wrote one quarter of the New Testament. He likes prepositions. You grammarians are going to eat this up. In order to follow Paul's logic, you've got to pay attention to his use of prepositions. In his literary compilation, in Adam is a way to refer to all of humanity. We are all connected to Adam. Adam is the origin of the human race to which we belong. 
In Christ is a way to refer to Christians or Jesus followers or believers. Pick your synonym. To paraphrase Paul then in this passage, what he's saying is all those in Adam die, all those in Christ will be made alive. God will gift a glorious, resplendent, majestic resurrection body to those who are in Christ. Those in Christ will experience a bodily resurrection and inhabit a new physical creation. The natural next question is, am I in Christ? Are you in Christ? This expression is complicated, it's mysterious, and yet, as one theologian said, it is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. To understand what it means to be in Christ is to understand salvation itself. Now, this is a little bit like putting together a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle. One piece all by itself may not be all that helpful. You've got to start fitting things together in order for the picture to become clearer. So I'm going to attempt to do that with this in Christ language. Let me take you first to Galatians 3, verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. So we've got a couple of pieces we can add to the jigsaw puzzle. First thing we can observe is that those who are in Christ are children of God. If you are in Christ, you have been adopted by God into God's family as a son or daughter. Additionally, we become children of God. We are united to Christ. We get into Christ through faith. Now, faith requires an object. You have to have faith in something. And throughout the New Testament, the kind of faith that gets us into Christ is faith in Christ, trusting him to say, believing he is who he said he is. Those who are in Christ are children of God, and we get into Christ through faith. Now, the very next verse gives us a couple more pieces to the jigsaw puzzle, a couple more pieces to the in Christ puzzle. Look at it. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, you see a little word for in verse 27. It's, it's a conjunction, which means the thought started in verse 26 continues into verse 27. The two verses together constitute a thought unit. And here we're given a couple more pieces to the puzzle. Those who have been baptized have been incorporated into Christ. Now let me pause here for a minute. You know, the New Testament teaching on baptism ought to put baptism on the forefront of every church's mission. Baptism is taught in a a dozen different passages throughout the New Testament, but just look at the verse in front of us. There is a clear link between being in Christ, faith, and baptism. You cannot pull them apart. They are links in a chain. Links in a chain inseparably bound. Doug Moo commenting on this verse from Galatians says this, faith is the only means of coming into relationship with Jesus Christ. However, baptism is is more than simply a symbol of that new relationship. It is a capstone of the process by which one is converted and initiated into the church. As such, Paul can appeal to baptism as shorthand for the entire conversion experience. I'm gonna be teaching on this at a later date, but the question we're wrestling with is, am I in Christ? And based on these two verses, there are two questions, good follow-up questions to ask. Am I in Christ? Well. Am I trusting Jesus to save me? That's the first thing. Would Jesus say, not what I say, but would Jesus say, I have real, genuine faith in him? And the second question is, have I been baptized? Baptism sets forth visibly our union with Jesus. It's the capstone of the process by which we are converted. Anecdotally, I will tell you, Sometimes the insecurity people feel over whether or not they are in Christ has been due to the fact they've not been baptized as believers. More on that in in weeks to come. Now look further, verse 27. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So we've got more links added to the chain. So joined to the ideas of in Christ, faith, baptism is now clothed with Christ. This is helpful imagery. Clothing, clothing, clothing. Think about the clothing you wear on a daily basis. Your clothes are kept closer to you than any other possession you own. You rely on your clothes for shelter and protection at every moment. They go everywhere with you. And that should be true of you with regard to Christ if you are in Christ. Do you keep Jesus closer to you than anything you own? Do you rely on him for shelter and protection at every moment? Does Jesus go everywhere with you? Being clothed with Christ and being in Christ are related ideas. Now, that's not all clothing does. What else does clothing do? Clothing is adornment. It covers our nakedness. 
God has been covering our shame since Adam and Eve sinned in the third chapter of the Bible. To clothe yourself with Christ is to say that in God's sight we are loved because when he looks at us, rather than seeing our many sins, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Are you wearing the righteousness of Christ? Now, let me remind you, remind you of the, the original question we're asking. How do I receive a resurrection body? The scriptures clearly teach that believers will be gifted a glorious and resplendent resurrection body outfitted perfectly for life in the new creation. Paul's answer is, you have to be in Christ. Are you in Christ? Let me offer a few mental pictures that I hope will bring clarity to this in Christ language. If you want to get to England, then finding a a flight to London is a good idea. But it would be a very strange traveler who goes to Chicago O'Hare Airport, finds the relevant Boeing 747, and then sprints down the runway hoping to follow after its general direction. Neither does the traveler watch the plane, awestruck from the lounge, and seek inspiration for their own powers of flight. No, if the traveler wants to get to London, there is one relationship they must have to the plane. They need to be in it. If they're in the plane, then everything that's happening to the plane will happen to the traveler. This is a Christian's connection to Jesus. Jesus is not merely an example to follow. He's not just our inspiration to admire. He's our champion and we are in him. The Christian life is not fundamentally about copying Jesus' actions, though that becomes a great joy. It's not at heart about admiring Jesus from a distance, though we do admire him. Fundamentally, Christianity is about being united to Jesus, sharing forever in all that he is and all that he has done. A Christian is one with Jesus. One author illustrates our union with Christ this way. He says, I have a friend who used to be Mickey Mouse. She was the person inside the costume at Disney. Reflecting on her time in Mickey, she said, growing up, I thrived on behavior modification. I thought if I'm good, I will be loved. If I'm bad, I'll be rejected. I learned to wear a mask, not to show what was really going on. My core beliefs were that I was not worthy, accepted, or loved, so I would clamor and manufacture ways to elicit the positive responses I wanted from people. When I put on Mickey's costume, I got that positive response times 100. She felt safe and loved, covered in Mickey's righteousness. To be in Christ is to be covered in Jesus' righteousness. Have you experienced that? Have you experienced the love and safety that being covered in Jesus' righteousness offers? Rankin Wilburn recounts a story, writing, when I was in junior high school, I played football in an organized team for the first time. And my size gave our team a distinct advantage. I was the tiniest player on the field. I was so small, in fact, that when I had the ball, the opposing team had a difficult time tackling me because they couldn't find me. I was hard to see. In crucial situations, when we had to have the yards, our go-to play was called Refrigerator Right. In honor of Chicago, Bears defensive lineman turned running back William the Refrigerator Perry. Coach Junior set Andrew, the biggest guy on our team, in front of me as a blocker. And the quarterback handed me the ball. With Andrew leading the way, one man made way for another. I was completely obscured by his size, strength, and powerful work, but I was running to freedom. Everything that was supposed to hit me hit Andrew. He blazed a path for me against hostile forces. He made a way to glory. I was hidden in him. Are you in Christ? To close, I'll draw your attention to a scripture passage that may help you see the signs that you are in Christ because there's evidence of it. Much like the wind, which you can't see, it can be difficult to see if you're in Christ. But you can see the effects of the wind so too we can see the effects of being in Christ. Jesus writes in John 15, he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me 
and I in you, you will bear much fruit. The spring upon us, the imagery is encouraging, it's helpful. Jesus says he's the vine or the trunk of the tree, and we are the branches. If we remain in Christ, we will bear much fruit. Fruit is evidence you're in Christ. Do you see fruit? Better yet, do other people see fruit in you? Over the past five years, do the people who know you best say you have become more patient, gentle, joyful, peace-filled, self-controlled? Over the past five years, have you noticed a change in what you think about? In other words, is Philippians 4, 8 truer of you now than it was five years ago? Here's what we read there. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Is this truer of you now than it was five years ago? This is evidence you're in Christ. And one day, God will gift you with a glorious, majestic, resplendent resurrection body perfectly suited to the new creation you'll inhabit. When I was in middle school, my parents introduced me to the story of Johnny Erickson Tata. And I think about her every Easter She was in an accident when she was 17 years old, left her a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the shoulders down. And while she was still trying to come to terms with the accident, she would go to church in her wheelchair. And the problem with being in a wheelchair is that at some point um, in her church's liturgy, every Sunday, the minister would call everyone to kneel, which drove home to her the fact that she was stuck in a wheelchair. And once she was at a convention which the the speaker urged people to get down on their knees and pray and everyone did except Johnny. This is what she said about that. She said, with everyone kneeling, I certainly stood out and I couldn't stop the tears. But she said it wasn't because of self-pity. She was crying because of the sight of hundreds of people on their knees before God. She said it was a picture of heaven. And then she continued weeping at another thought. She said, sitting there, I was reminded that in heaven I will be free to jump up, dance, kick, and do aerobics. And sometime before the guests are called to the banquet table at the wedding feast of the Lamb, the first thing I plan to do on resurrected legs is to drop on grateful, glorified knees. I will quietly kneel at the feet of Jesus. And then she adds, I with shriveled, bent fingers, atrophied, muscled, gnarled knees, and no feeling from the shoulders down, will one day have a new body, light, bright, and clothed in righteousness, powerful and dazzling. Can you imagine, she says, the hope that the resurrection gives someone like me? Only in the resurrection of Jesus Christ do people find such enormous hope to live? Let's pray. Jesus, is only because you died and rose again we have this hope. And one day the Father will gift us who are in Christ a glorious resurrection body perfectly suited to enjoy an eternal new creation. Fill our minds and hearts with joy over this future that awaits those who have produced the fruit of righteousness. For your glory and great name, we pray these things. Amen.
Savior now to wash our feet. Now at His feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame, now robed in Shines now for all to see. Your name, your name is victory. Your praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. Your praise. Christ our King. The fear that held us now gives way to Him who is our peace. His final breath.
To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. And God's people said, amen.